All, All hail, hail Jailbait Dondarrion, Queen in the North. Man, so much has happened over the past ten years. Does anyone want to talk about it? You know, the return of the Three-Eyed Bro, how Lord Oakheart got a nuclear warhead, the Kraken situation, why Sir Twenty Goodman is still covered with Freud's blood, how it came to be that Jailbait Dondarrion is Queen in the North. I don't see how any of this is relevant. Agreed. That would be a waste of time. Okay, I mean, what are we going to do instead? Anybody want to watch a boy jerk off out a window? And our episode begins with... Um... I'm sorry, I'm looking at my notes and it just says, Insert poo joke? And then that's crossed out and it says, Insert sex joke? And that's crossed out and it says, Insert poo joke again. Well, Rhaenyra is giving birth and... No maesters, by the way, which is actually a very nice touch. Fuck those guys. But of course, we don't actually get to see the birth of a child because that's how screwed up our society is. Heads get bashed in. Oh yeah, let's do that. Balls cut off and put on a stump. Why not? Orgy, please more. A human face caved in from repeated pummeling. Show it all. But no birth. I mean, come on, let's think of the children. The hypocrisy is actually rather noteworthy, as this is clearly a parallel scene. Episode 5 ended with the death of a Joffrey, and episode 6 begins with the birth of a Joffrey. Thematically, the events are nicely connected. Yet they aren't really given equal weight, as social tolerance for violence and entertainment exceeds the social tolerance of... of, um... Yeah, I'm not sure why showing a birth is taboo. In fact, here. Here's the birth of a random child. Ah, the sky is falling, the sky is falling. Anyway, Rhaenyra has the best looking newborn since the dawn of days, covered with orange blood of Valyria. And then a midwife comes in to tell us to completely throw out any sympathy or goodwill that we may have built up for Alicent over the past five episodes. Nice work, Emily Carey. Everything you established was undone off screen. Rhaenyra is ready to bring Joffrey to Alicent herself when suddenly she remembers she left the iron on. By the way, everyone, this is a placenta. The world didn't end. Soon after having a chunk of her uterine wall ripped out, Rhaenyra and Laenor head to see Alicent, and to perhaps celebrate the first major media depiction of post-birth uterine contraction cramps, the director decided to do this with one big artsy continuous shot. Bravo. Hey, it's Lord Coswell, a man ahead of his time, sucking up to Rhaenyra. Yeah, Lord Coswell is really sticking his neck out for Rhaenyra. Um... Uh, I bet Lady Caswell is a big fan of Lord Caswell because he likes to give head. Sure, that works, Chad. And then they pass by Sir Crispin, who, besides being immune to the laws of Westeros, also appears to be immune to the flow of time. Theory, Sir Crispin is Gilly's baby. They then meet with the wicked stepmother, who, by the way, only wears green now, and thankfully the awkward scene is interrupted by the king. And it's here we find out that the boy will be named Joffrey. Which, by the way, destroys any of the Joffrey was trying to hurt someone excuses that people may have tried to put forward in clearing Kristen Cole. Clearly, Joffrey Lonmouth is remembered fondly by Lenor, and everyone, including the king, is perfectly content with Joffrey being remembered fondly. He's so fine with it that he's willing to have his grandson named Joffrey and not some Valyrian name. So if Joffrey did nothing wrong and is being honored, how is it that Crispin is not being punished for killing him and striking Prince Lenor? And so I did one of those polls on Twitter, and granted the audience is my fans, but two-thirds thought that the Kristen Cole situation was a pretty glaring error. But a glare from Lenor is all we're getting. Well, despite the fact that Rhaenyra is bleeding everywhere, she goes back to her chambers and decides to sit on her nice couch. Now in the source material, Harwin is the personal shield of Rhaenyra on Dragonstone, giving him an excuse to be around her and the privacy. But here in Hot D, he's the commander of the City Watch, giving him no reason to be here. His behavior is actually way, way more suspicious than the hair color of the children. Why is this dude hanging out with Rhaenyra if he isn't having an affair with her? I mean, even in our modern society, frequent private time behind closed doors between two adults results in rumors of romance. This is the Middle Ages, sort of, where people are obsessed with chastity. How have they been getting away with this for 10 years? 
In fact, I'm surprised there wouldn't be talk of Laris and Alicent having an affair. Where is Princess Rhaenyra? Oh, she's in her chambers alone with a young man who clearly isn't gay. Where is Queen Alicent? Oh, she's in her chambers alone with a young man who doesn't look like the Crypt Keeper. Next, we go to the Dragon Pit where we find that Alicent only dresses her children in green as well. And we see that Jace has no problem controlling his dragon, while Aemond is dragonless. Because what dragon would want to bond with such a whiny bitch? And so the boys decide to give Aemond the Pink Dread. Um, logistically, how did these children secure a pig, transport it to the Dragon Pit, sneak it in, and then have it not eaten by dragons? I don't know, Laurie Strong? We then find out that the Kingsguard cares just as much about Aemond as they do about Rhaenyra, as he nearly gets burned up by Dreamfire. After Aemond gets yelled at by his mom, we find out that the Weirwood and the Godswood should have been cut down ages ago, as Helena has been getting prophetic dreams. Time traveling brand planned it all! Really, Alicent should have been paying attention, as prophetic dreams are the fourth leading cause of death in Westeros. We then get this heartwarming scene, where we find out that Viserys no longer plays with Alicent, but has found a new friend. Ennard and the king have a special relationship. They are building a new Valyria together. For tabletop gaming. Alicent, in Green Dress number 2, essentially tells Viserys that Rhaenyra's children are bastards, and Viserys says, you know, in Fire and Blood, Rhaenys' hair is black and Emma Arryn's hair is never given, and we know nothing of the looks of Harwin Strong. Harwin even had a broken collarbone when Jace was fathered. Even Septon Eustace, who has no love of Rhaenyra, doesn't think that Rhaenyra's children are bastards. You're really just buying into the biased storytelling of Archmaester Gildane. And Alicent says, what? He then tells a pretty cool story about his jet black horse that mated with a silver horse to produce a common brown horse. And this struck me as relevant as, in the book, Kristen Cole's hair is black, Rhaenyra silver, and the children common brown. And here in the show, we have the moon tea scene, and Jace has straight hair. His brother Curly, along with Harwin Strong. And so I thought, maybe the show is implying that Crispin is Jace's dad. So I did another poll. Though by a pretty overwhelming margin, people think, nope, Jace is just Harwin's. Still though, it got me thinking. Going back nine years, when Rhaenyra had her first child and his hair was dark, shouldn't Alicent and Kristen Cole have considered the possibility that Kristen Cole was the father? I mean, this episode makes it seem like the rumors with Harwin Strong built up over the years and this third child is the straw that broke the camel's back. They shouldn't have been considering Harwin as the suspect very strongly nine years ago. Especially Kristen Cole. He doesn't know about the moon tea, does he? I mean, it should be at least a thought lingering in his mind. Yeah, especially considering he's still obsessed with Rhaenyra after 10 years. I mean, it's one thing to Google search an old flame, but to have an emotional outburst where you call your ex-girlfriend from 10 years ago a cunt in front of your boss? The guy is freaking nuts. So, House of the Dragon is always trying to one-up Game of Thrones. We saw Tommen leap from a tower, and so to one-up him, a hundred million little Aegons leap from a tower. After this, Aegon gets scolded by his mother for not perceiving Rhaenyra as a threat, just as Alicent was scolded by her father for not perceiving Rhaenyra as a threat. And in both cases, the characters are kind of wet. And then we get to Lena and Daemon in Pentos, flying around and living the good life as exiles at... not Illyrio's house. Yeah, thank goodness we never get an explanation on how Lena came to ride Vagar. And also, thank goodness we never get an explanation on why they're exiled. I mean, that's just best left off screen, am I right? I mean, it's irrelevant stuff. A young exiled girl becoming a powerful dragon rider capable of single-handedly destroying cities and conquering kingdoms? That is unlikely to have any impact on anybody. Well, to be somewhat fair, the source material never gives an explanation of these events either. Lena, who lives on Driftmark, somehow claims Vagar in the Dragon Pit. Or maybe she went to Dragonstone and claimed him there. They're exiled with no real explanation. Viserys just didn't like the marriage, just because. Though the exile is only a year or so in the book instead of a decade. The birth of the twins actually makes Viserys forgive Daemon, his anger receding as easily as it came on. It's George R. R. Martin at perhaps his laziest. Oh, the twins! Thank goodness we also never get an explanation on how Daemon finally got it up. Look, we just have to assume that Lena found Vagar somehow when she was wandering alone in the wilderness as a 15-year-old girl, and then chose not to bring her dragon to the wedding last episode, even though her brother and mom brought theirs, and I'm guessing that they have sex on Dragonback, and that gets Damon off. By the way, Damon's kids are pretty dark. Are you sure that he's the father and not... 
Randor Valarian. Anyway, rather than using a master at arms, Viserys allows his children and grandchildren to be trained by a murderer. And surprise, surprise, the psychopath teaches the children to fight like psychopaths, telling them to strike people on the ground rather than to show mercy. But to be fair, this was the very weakness that led to Damon's downfall at the tourney. Naturally, Harwin Strong intervenes, Crispin implies that Harwin is the boy's father, and a fight breaks out. Oh, and why hello, Shade of the Lamp. It's been a long time. Hello, I just wanted to point out that this scene is a clear parallel to when Sir Criston attacked Joffrey Lonmouth, and since the scenes are paralleled, it's okay that Sir Criston received no punishment. Episode 5 is saved. Ah, uh, is it? Four Kingsguard suddenly appear to stop Harwin, and then Harwin is kicked out of the city watch and sent home for striking a Kingsguard. How does this make sense when Sir Crispin struck a future prince consort, murdered a nobleman, and ruined a wedding, and no Kingsguard did anything? Because they paralleled it. Yeah, and? The High Septon annulled it. Well, in the next scene, Rhaenyra uses her secret passage to sneak around and listen to Lionel getting pissed at Harwin for fighting, rather than for the ten years of brazenly hanging out with the princess behind closed doors. Huh. With the passageways, they could have established that the romantic tryst was a little more secret. Rather than, you know, Harwin brazenly coming and going through the front door. I mean, look at this, they left the door open. Anyone can look in and see Harwin creeping around. Why didn't they use the secret passageways? I guess for the same reason they didn't make him her sworn shield. So then we get this handmaid putting a hot towel on Rhaenyra's breast to help with the pain from stopping milk production, and then Laenor comes in and feels bad about Rhaenyra's pained breasts. Huh. This is a lot of setup about Rhaenyra's milk. I wonder where this is going. Laenor then tells Rhaenyra that he's having a midlife crisis and wants to go fight in the Stepstones, and Rhaenyra tells him, Dude, you're like... 25? Maybe? I don't know, but you need to stay because shit is getting real. To which Lenor says, The wise sailor flees the storm as it gathers. Didn't his dad once say to elude a storm, you can either sail into it or around it, but you must never await its coming? Are these Valarians just throwing out storm metaphors to justify whatever they want to do? We then get to Damon's daughter, Reyna, who says that she's sad because she doesn't have a dragon, and her mother tells her that she has to claim a dragon. Like she did. You know, mysteriously off-screen. And then Lena meets with Damon and says that she misses her brother, and that she thinks Damon does too. Wait, Damon misses Lenor? I mean, I guess they did fight together for years in the Stepstones. They definitely fucked, right? I mean, this episode establishes that Damon is bi. And last episode he did say that Lenor was pretty, and war can be a lonely, lonely time. I mean, I don't think Lena was talking about Damon missing Lenor, but, um... I mean, I think they probably had sex, but the fandom is pretty split. We also find out that Daemon hasn't been doing much in Pentos, except reading about old dead dragon lords. So Daemon is now also obsessed with prophecy? I wonder if he's either going to start playing the harp or start collecting miniatures. Next we get to the small council where it seems that, after discovering back in episode 2 that anyone can just walk into a small council meeting, Alicent has been doing this quite regularly and is now running the show. Green outfit number 3. And even though Rhaenyra is clearly better at ruling, Alicent is openly hostile to her. Regardless, Rhaenyra decides to offer a Jace-Helena marriage to help repair the feud. And all that lactation talk from earlier, well, it was leading to this. Rhaenyra leaking. This actually has no bearing on the plot whatsoever. And despite being the friggin' king of the goddamn Seven Kingdoms and thinking the marriage is a great idea, Viserys doesn't get what he wants. Alicent nixes the notion, even though she lacks any power to do so. And so then Lionel, fearing that maybe he might not be a good hand or perfectly impartial, wants to resign, proving that he's a great hand. Viserys, suddenly finding his spine, refuses. Then Alicent heads to her chambers to find Laurie Strong waiting there, who has rather rudely scheduled their meal right after the small council meeting. I mean, give the woman some buffer time. Laris clearly wanted Allison to get all worked up and speaks of how his father is not impartial, but neither would be Otto Hightower. Allison snaps and says she doesn't care about impartiality, she wants favoritism towards her. Which Laris interprets as, Okay, okay, fine, I'll kill my own father and brother. I mean, who wouldn't come to that conclusion? And so the Bee Master goes to work, or as some people call him, the Apiarist. The Apiarist? Wouldn't that be Lord Beesbury? 
You're saying Lord Beesbury is at the center of this conspiracy? Well, no, but Larius is, like, in control of his bees. Isn't he already the master of the rats? Yes, the bees and the rats. And maybe also bats because of Harrenhal. Bees and rats and bats and malvales. And so he creates some little birds. Meanwhile, in Pentos, Lena is faced with the seventh leading cause of death, and the doctor tells Damon that she's gonna die, so maybe he should slice her open. Damon refuses, though no one tries to smash the outcoming birth to save Lena either. I feel with a little effort, we could bring number seven down to eight or nine on this list. Lena, in excruciating pain, decides she wants to die, so she walks to Vagar and asks him to burn her up. Vagar lets out his fire breath, and... It turns out Lena is fireproof. Still in intense pain, she asks Vagar to do it again. And nope, she's still fireproof. So they try again, and again, and again, and again. Eventually, Vagar just steps on her, and Damon, after watching the whole thing, yells to Reyna, Hey, mount Vagar now! Mount the dragon now! Now's your chance! Meanwhile, back in King's Landing, Harwin is leaving town and says goodbye to the kids. Jace is upset and asks his mother, is Harwin strong, my father? And Rhaenyra says, Your father is... Enter the stonemason. Rhaenyra then heads outside to Lenor and tells him, To elude a storm, one must sail into it. Or something. Whatever, let's just go to Dragonstone. Then at Harrenhal, the bees do what bees do and start a fire, killing Harwin and Lionel. And then Rhaenyra and company arrive at Dragonstone. I sure hope they remember to bring their four dragons. Rhaenyra wore that riding. Viserys then sees some Malvales running around his room, and we end the episode with green outfit number four, and Laris telling Alicent that he killed his dad and brother. I mean, realistically, with Laris being such an unstable and unpredictable individual, Alicent should just have Crispin kill him, right? Sure, realistically, but realistically, no one would wear so many green outfits. Arg, I was thinking about naming our new boy Stefan after my father. Or perhaps Eddard. I like the name Joffrey the best. Joffrey? Arg, like after Prince Joffrey Valarian, the boy that everyone thought was secretly a bastard? Or is it after Joffrey Lannister, the Joffrey who wasn't really a Lannister and only took on that name? Or Joffrey Dane, the cruel sadistic knight? No, he is named after Joffrey Lanmuth the famed secret lover of Lenor Valarian who was beaten to death for no reason and whose killer received no punishment. Yeah, all right. But our next kid is going to be named after a whore I banged. 